Welcome back, everybody. Another week of Smarter B2B executive briefings. And really excited this week because we've got uh, someone from my past who I recently reconnected because of the whole COVID-19 thing and had no idea uh, what she had been up to or what work they were doing. And it's not only super important, but highly relevant, I think, as we move from the last couple of weeks where we really went through what it looks like to re-engineer your business model um, in general as the P&L got thrown out the window in the last several months. But now we got to talk about who's going to execute that business model. And so I couldn't have had more serendipity in the last uh, 10 days as I got an invitation to an old San Diego State grad school uh, and career that I started out in um, and reconnected with a former colleague, Natalie Johnson, who's now running Vital Solutions. So um, before we get her out here and, and we spend the next 25, 30 minutes just pulling as much gold out of her as we can, she's on the front lines of, of organizational uh, well-being and culture. We'll talk about that throughout this session. Uh, let's just do a quick shout out and thank you for uh, the ones who make these possible every week. So um, emerge.com, check them out. Um, they are not, uh, they, they actually branded themselves this long before uh, the pandemic, but um, it's a very uh, apropos brand as it relates. So they're a great sponsor, mentioned Decisions 2020 um, and find a more efficient way to go to market with uh, your sales and qualified lead generation at emerge.com. You can reach out to Cameron and he will take good care of you. And so without further ado, let's uh, make sure she's ready in the green room and the, the screen is not frozen. And all right, there we go. And I uh, think we're here. So Natalie, welcome to the show. Thank you, Chris. I'm super excited to be here. I had the most strange thing just happen. It was like um, I, I went into rabbit speed mode and I couldn't hear myself. So. Uh, I, I got the same thing on this end. So oh, oh great. Well, that's perfect. That's Better now. <laughs> the benefit of being live is. All right. Well, um, I thought I talked fast before, but that made me look like I talked really fast. So <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> so it's it's um it's it's really great to to have reconnected and you know blown away by the work that you and Rebecca and the team are doing. Um, and uh, just wanted to uh, you know, dive right into organizational well-being, this kind of concept that you guys have coined and put out into the marketplace and that I think um, has a lot of merit both uh, post-pandemic, uh, but also obviously you've been doing some phenomenal work the last decade with large enterprises, medium enterprises, and everything in between. So uh, from your mouth, kind of talk to us just in general about um, – what organization well-being is, but then, you know, let's talk about what you're seeing, you know, we'll kind of dive into what you're seeing from the front lines of, of this in real time. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we focus on consulting around human capital and organizational well-being is something that we actually learned over time um, through mistakes and trying to address the the health of the individual only. And so we address organizational well-being, which is essentially more than just individual well-being. It includes the individual and a holistic approach around well-being. So physical, emotional, mental, social, um, even financial. But it also includes team dynamics and communication. And what we believe is most important is leadership. And so when you're looking at an organization as a whole and you're trying to address things such as change or adversity or things that are unexpected, traditionally what you'll see is what struggles are the individual, the teams and the leadership. And so we're one of the few possibly only companies that address all three, uh, because if you only address one, it doesn't really gain much traction within an organization when you're trying to develop thriving cultures and, and thriving people. And to answer your question, what we're seeing, it's really interesting because um, the clients that reach out to us are typically the clients that are struggling. So whether that's a healthcare organization that's struggling with surgeons who are burning out um, to a smaller business that maybe they're recognizing the culture isn't what they want and they're seeing a really high level of turnover, people tend to turn to us when things aren't going well and they recognize there's a change that needs to happen. And so what we're seeing right now is there's a lot, especially in smaller businesses, um, a lot of struggles, a lot of change, a lot of unexpected 
um, situations. And that's really where we typically would come in. So for us, from a business standpoint, this really isn't that much different than any other time when teams or organizations are struggling with everything from um, a, a merger to reorganization to letting people go. Those things happen all the time, maybe not as significant as now, but what we're seeing now is pretty typical for us. Um, people and companies are struggling. Leaders are overwhelmed. They're not sure of the, the direction they wanna go. Their employees are struggling and specifically we're seeing you know, of course, people being moved to remote work environments, they're not used to it. And instead of seeing this balance between integrating work and life, what people are typically doing is they're working all the time and they're not taking breaks. And so we're seeing an increase in burnout. Um, and so I'll, I'll pause there for a moment. Yeah, I think, I think you know, there's a lot to unpack in there. Um, and so we'll try and do that in, in, our, in our time today because um, this is an area that's kind of like, a lot of things that I think are hitting tipping points that only happen when you have, I hate to use the word crisis and I'm tired of hearing the word unprecedented. All those things are true, but I think uh, the, the reality is that um, we move as human beings or organizations, which are run by human beings. We move when we're forced to, not necessarily when it's in our best interest, right? And this is like right. the whole back to vitamins versus Tylenol kind of sales, you know, strategy, right? Is, um, one is good for you and prevents a lot of stuff. One is, you know, insurance against a, a bad headache or bad decisions that caused a bad headache. And so, um, you know, you guys fall into a category that cross pollinates a couple of things. There's leadership development, there's training and development, learning and development, there's HR functions and, you know, corporate wellness and that kind of thing. And so there's these, I don't want to say these pigeonhole buckets, but there's these things that you guys deal with and in. Mm -hmm. And yet you're not really categorized as just one of those, right? And so you came up with this uh, way of explaining it called organizational well-being because um, well-being is kind of, I, I would imagine, well-being is a state, like a, it's, a, it's a state of health or a state of function. And, um, and then you're, you're talking about it through the organization so that that's down to the individual level, but also the collective uh, culture, which is that group habit of all those individuals, how that plays out as, as a net net, right. On, on right. whether the company is moving in a healthy direction, both culturally as well as on the P and L or whether they're moving in the wrong direction. So um, you're, you're inundated more than likely, but some of the things that I would imagine make it difficult on your side is not only, you know, sorting through maybe a, an influx of leads, and, and figuring out ways to scale your outreach, because a lot of what you do has been very hands-on. Like you've been very successful yeah. like 10 years working with, like we said, large companies from you know the healthcare space to other industries. And a lot of that is very tac you know, tactile, right? It's been hands-on yeah. and I know, I know you from way back. So I know you're, you know, you're that kind of person anyway, like me, like you're a hugger and you're a, you're, a, <laughs> you know, you're a in your face kind of. Hawker. Yeah, you <laughs> know, you're, you're somewhere. <laughs> So how has it been for you with current clients kind of um, delivering that virtually, which I know is just, you know, an adjustment um, in the short run. But then also, uh, what do you think the future of that means? Because the need is just beginning, in my opinion, and, and it may just be my opinion, but I, I don't even think we're at the tip of the iceberg yet of the negative impacts that are going to permeate society and then thus these organizations. Yeah. So, so what you do is more important than ever and going to be more needed than ever. What are the what are the things that you're seeing from clients today as far as good or bad ways to respond to this? And then in your well, business, you know, what are some of the things you're thinking about? I'll back up just a little bit to see what we saw initially, you know, in, in late February, early March, when we first began thinking about, wow, th this might be a real true quarantine where people have to stay home. And so what we saw from our clients immediately was we're shutting everything down. We're not going to do a um, strategic planning meeting on the well-being of the organization for the next five years because we have to pause and see what this is going to look like. We're not going to do a live two-day in-person training because we don't think we're going to be able to travel. We're not going to have a conference. So the initial response that we saw was that we felt like our clients were putting us into this bucket of extra services or training and development 
or resources for their their humans, their people, but it was, I don't want to say fluff, but they viewed us as something extra that wasn't essential in the beginning. And, you know, as you and I know, this is the workforce, this is the people, this is the people that are working towards that common goal for the organization. You need to support your people. But initially people didn't view us that way. And so they either canceled or put it off to the side or postponed. And what we decided as a smaller consulting firm was this is the time that we don't necessarily need to be pushing sales um, directly. What we need to do is support our existing clients in any way that they need supported. Everyone is really uncertain. There's a lot of panic. There's a lot of layoffs. So how can we support them in this current environment? And then that transitioned into we had a lot of clients that we were providing some virtual content to and get them to think through the process of if I pay attention to my people and the culture, the culture that still exists, even though people are at home, how is that going to impact us long term when things do begin to return to normal? And so it shifted a bit where people are now seeing, wow, we actually need this support for our people. And so yeah. we went from lots of services and programs being canceled to, OK, how can we do this in a virtual manner that's short, that gets to the point that does create some engagement and motivation with our people, not just individuals, but the culture, the teams, the leaders. Um, and so we've seen a shift upward in, in creating more virtual content, but it's much shorter. Um, okay much shorter focusing on things like let's just have a conversation about how stress is impacting our frontline people or people who are still going into work, but also impacting the leaders who are stuck at home and can't go anywhere anymore. And so we're talking more specifically on topics that support them now instead of longer term strategy. Yeah. So, um, so how, um, what are some of the things that maybe organizational leaders that are either current clients or that uh, that might be listening to this that aren't clients, but that are, you know, now out of that freeze panic mode, because everybody pretty much went in there, right? Like, yeah, the markets, everybody did that. Everything froze. And it's like, okay, we don't know how bad this is. Um, we don't know when testing is going to be available. We don't know, right? We don't know a lot of things. And so everybody kind of just in every industry and everywhere across the board for the first time in humanity, but Every business, everybody kind of just said, okay, we're going to freeze. Some some yeah. said we're going to cut and cancel. But um, most people just went, if we don't have to cut and cancel yet, we're going to freeze until we kind of have more clarity. Uh, and, and then, you know, over the last couple of weeks, we've emerged out of that, right? We've come to that point where now it's like, we still don't necessarily know what the <clears throat> next two qu quarters might reveal. Or we don't know if there's going to be a second phase. But we kind of understand that there's at least now a sense of what new normal might entail and we yeah. got to start preparing for it, right? We may not be doing a five-year plan, but we need to at least create a through the end of 2020, first part of 2021 plan that we can start to execute against. And so that's now starting to happen. What are the things that they're going to discover at the leadership level that they need to rapidly have frameworks, right? Or do to, minimize the, um, you know, the negative impacts, like people fearing coming back to work if even if they're allowed to, people fearing, you know, uh, all these different things, people dealing with, yeah. you know, mortgage issues or death or other things that obviously, you know, people dealing with the Minnesota thing, right? Like there's so many things that have just, that are going to continue to happen that don't necessarily touch us maybe directly, but that impact our consciousness in a time where it's fragile. Right. So how do they give us a framework? Like how should they be, even if they're not your client, like how, how are you walking your clients through that planning prep or, or that assessment? Like what are some of the nuggets? Well, what's interesting right now is even though some of the panic is behind us and we're now beginning to move forward in a direction of, you know, COVID is releasing us a little bit. We're going to move forward, but we need to have a new plan. We need to have a new direction of how we're going to move forward and what that looks like. Um, what we typically see with our clients and not specifically at the leadership level is everybody jumps in with both hands, both feet, head down and work hard. Lots of hours, um, lots of commitment to the company. And from a leadership level, they now have, you know, some kind of strategic plan of where we need to move forward, what we want this to look like when we do begin to return to normal. 
And what tends to happen is leadership begins to lead what we call, they begin to lead over their people. This is the plan. This is why we have a plan. This is what I need you to do. And now I need you to check in with me and let me know how you're doing along the way. So you start to see things come up like uh, micromanaging, people still burning out. Sometimes people who wouldn't traditionally burn out in a normal environment are now burning out because they've got their heads down moving forward. They're at home. They can work all the time now. And it's creating a climate and a culture that is the harder you work, the better we are. And, you know, wearing that badge of busy is actually where burnout is created. That's where the relationships are created, where people don't necessarily align with and recognize that their value and their purpose within an organization. And the company begins to shift away from the ultimate bottom line of business and the purpose of what they're doing. So I don't want to say that we see it 100 percent across the board, but we see it in really, really high numbers that all of a sudden people aren't panicked anymore. They have a plan and now they're all in on the plan. Leadership now wants some control over that plan. So they're doing things that feel controlling. I want to you're seeing micromanaging and, you know, to take a step back, because I don't want to focus on what necessarily the problem is or how people well, are. I think, going no, I, think, I think this is important, though, because it's not really yeah. identifying the problem. It's almost you're, you're kind of giving us things to be thinking about. Am I resisting? You know, can I resist or am I leaning towards micromanagement or overbearingness, you know, like leading over my people if I'm in that role um, or am I? Am I being you know, overly led and and I have a relationship where I can talk to that person and say, hey, I get it. You're trying really hard. We're here to help, but you got to like, you got to include us more. Like in other words, that dialogue can, depending on the relationship, some don't have that relationship with their boss, some do, but you're giving people thing to think about is, you, you know, try not to lead over your people. Don't wear the badge of busy, right? Yeah. That's uh, those are those are important nuggets to, to anchor and go, oh, OK, like I'm doing that or I'm not doing that or that's something I should, you know, kind of look for. Right. 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 So, and, it, so and it comes down, down to, you know, they think those are those are relevant. They're not problems. They're kind of like um, signposts. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a good thing to think about, I think, for anyone um, who is supervising teams or an organization or is a CEO or whatever, when you think about the best experiences you've had in leadership, whether that's a person or a team, what was so good about it? And what we find is it's the way those people made you feel, not what they said for you to do, but it's the way those people made you feel during the hard times that made them stand out to you. And then when you ask the opposing question, who was your worst leader? Who was the, um, who was the team that went, led you in the worst way? It comes down to it was the way they made me feel. Certainly they made me feel terrible. They made me feel not valuable, but also the way they dictated how things needed to be done. And the person didn't feel like they had a voice. And so we talk about this in terms of we really want to embrace leading with your people, not over them. And that includes things like this is new to us. We don't really know clearly what the future is going to look like. Here's what I tell you I think is going to happen. Here's the plan that I think we should move in, but I need your help. I need your skills. Um, and let's have a conversation as a team with your input, create some psychological safety in the room, and let's hear from everyone and move forward as a team in the future instead of, all right, I've got the plan. Here it is. Here's the specifics of what you're doing. Get ready, go. We have to get there. And so it's not difficult things that have to happen. It's a pause and an intentionality of leading with your team and not over them. And it takes a lot of courage and vulnerability to put it out there. I'm a leader. I'm scared. The future is uncertain, but here's what I think. And I, and I need your help because we want to do this and move forward together. Yeah. And I think, I think, you know, that's an interesting balance. Like, um, you know, in a lot of the work I've done on our side, which is not directly related to the stuff you do, but it deals with customer experience and, and operationalizing that, you know, we, we talk a lot about empathy and, and how I interpret what you're saying is deploy empathy. Yeah, uh, absolutely. As a leader, uh, well, not just as a leader, but from wherever you are, deploy empathy. And that's, that's easy for some people um, naturally. For a lot of leaders, it's not natural. Like it's not, you know, they maybe yeah. they got there because um, they don't have as much empathy and they're able to kind of 
focus yeah. in on some other metric. And so, so what I've found, and I don't know if you'd agree with this or not, what I've found is that um, deploying empathy is easier said than done. It's, it's at least being talked about now, meaning like we're starting to see a lot of prominent people talk about empathy, um, you know, in the, in the marketplace across different verticals. And yet, you know, you still need a framework uh, to help someone who's already naturally good at it, maybe do it more intentionally and at scale. And then also yeah. someone who's never good at it because they don't have any, give them a system where they can not suck and they can still get it, right? Because leadership does, you know, require kind of sometimes being confident for the group, even when you're not. But you're saying there's a balance there, which I agree with, like, mm -hmm. Even if you're not sure, you need to be a little bit more of a rock for your people, but you're only going to get them to trust you or, or know that you care about them by deploying empathy. So we, you know, we created a four box thing, think, feel, say, do, because, yeah. because if, if nothing else, you can think about your team and I could say, well, okay, so I know Natalie and she, you know, and I know Joe and I know whoever else I'm managing as my direct reports, um, COVID-19. I just use those two words, COVID-19. What does that make Natalie think? Yeah. Right. And because I've interfaced with you, I could maybe guess, right? Without even you in the room, I could just start on a notepad to guess. If I say the words COVID-19, what does she think? And there's things that are going to come to my head about what you might think. How would that make her feel? And then I could write down, well, she might be overly emotional or she might be totally ready for it and confident. And like, you know, she's the most resilient person I know. So she might feel ready or she might feel, you know, uh, bothered, but whatever. Right. Um, Joe, no, Joe's going to crumble. Joe's going to feel overwhelmed. Joe's going to whatever, whatever the thing is. And it's not a judgment. It's helping me get centered around. Well, then have I checked in with those people? Right? What, what are, what are the right. words that you might use? What would she say when someone says COVID-19? Some people are like, it's a scam. Or some people are going to be like, I don't want to die. Or some people like, what are the words they're going to use? Right. And, and like, literally you can almost role play that in your mind. Yeah or yeah. on paper. And then when you're talking with that group, you can just sit there and do a quick assessment of, have I heard Natalie say any of those words? And if I haven't, maybe I should check in. If I have, I kind of get a sense, maybe I should validate where she's at because I'm asking them to go this way with the 200 feet ahead of us that we can see and the thousands of miles we can't. Right. But they're not coming unless they know I get them. Yeah. And, and, and so I love your thing example. Do, right? So think, feel, say, do, just to complete that framework are the four things I would run through if I was doing that. And, and it seems like, you know, you have your own framework for that, but you're basically saying you have to do that work. You do. And a lot of times it feels like a big hurdle to go over, or sometimes it feels like that's going to take too much time. You know, when you're in the mindset of we need to get to really specific um, goals and, and timelines that can feel like, um, we don't have time for this. And it's very easy to, even in your example, when you're thinking about, you know, when I say COVID-19, how does that make a person or a team think? What do I think they're going to, how, how do I think they're going to be responding? Yeah. Um, even just that pause to think about it and then have the conversation is going to save you so much time, effort, um, and energy in the future, because then you don't have to necessarily address the the negative behaviors that come from it. And I love your example of just just putting that out there. When I say COVID-19, what's your first thought? How does that make you feel? I mean, that's a great conversation for any leader to have with their team to start the discussion and also recognize that we don't always know what other people are thinking. We can't see through their lens. And just that conversation creates more empathy in the room from the leader to the team, but also within uh, the team itself. And we do a lot of work on empathy. Um, and I think what's surprising to a lot of people is what it comes down to are these really practical strategies like what you just gave. What if you were to be more open to people giving you negative feedback that they don't agree with what you're saying? What would well, you need like to do? To do that like what you just said. I actually like what you just said a second ago, which made me rethink it too, is that I was suggesting they do it, you know, that the leader do this kind of on their own, thinking mm -hmm. about their people. Yeah. But, you know, depending on, uh, it may just be better. I mean, they may want to do that if they really need to practice, but it may be better to just sit there and say, 
Uh, hey, hey, Nat, let's talk for 20 minutes. I just want to huddle up with you, like do that to each direct report and say, um, yeah. play a little quick game here. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to ask you how you're doing. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to throw a word out there and I just want you to react to it. And there's no right or wrong answer. I'm just looking for what pops in your head, right? COVID-19. Right. What does that make you think? COVID-19. What does that make you think? Because that very exercise right there, how I'm interpreting what you're saying is as much of a leadership conversation as any conversation I could be having with them right now. Right. Because, because just the very fact of me actually, I don't want to say role playing, but asking them these questions directly in, in a dialogue is leading with them. I'm not telling them what the answer is. I'm just throwing a picture out in their mind and the picture in their mind is whatever they're going to see when they see COVID-19 because we all see something. Right. 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 And, and it's, it's timely and relevant now, now in the future, it could be one year plan or our, our go to market strategy. What do you think? What do you feel? Right. What, do you say? what do you do? Like I can substitute COVID-19 with any string of words. Right. Well, and I, and I think as a leader, when you're more proactive, just like you explained in having those conversations on a regular basis and asking your people how they feel and what their thoughts are, that begins to create that psychological safety that's needed so that people feel um, respected and purposeful within the company. Unfortunately, that's not typically where, um, I shouldn't say it's not where empathy should show up. That's very proactive. By the time we get called in to help organizations, that's not what's been happening. And what's happening more often than not is there's already been a negative consequence of not having empathy, of not feeling safe at work, of not speaking up. And so an example might be um, you recognize now that someone's performance is declining. Maybe it's COVID-19, maybe it's something else, but they're not living up to or working up to the standard that's expected. You've had a conversation with them. You've been very direct. This is what's expected. And they continue um, to not meet the expectation. And so this is now a situation where empathy is really hard. I can't empathize with them. I don't understand. I've laid it out there for them. I don't understand why their response is this way or why they're not living up to the expectation. And so empathy is really important in this conversation because you want to create connection, not disconnection. Um, but it's really hard for the person to create an empathetic response when you truly don't understand. And so asking those questions um, and even being honest that this is what I see and it's really hard for me to understand what's going on. So tell me more. Tell me more. I can't see through your lens of your background, what you're around at home, your education, your experience. You know, tell me more about what's happening. And those are those are the empathetic strategies, if you will, that we're teaching more often to leadership because it's the tough conversations and situations where I can't create empathy in this situation because I just don't get it. Um, but I want to create. Uh, that's a really, I mean, that's a really interesting, um, I think, nuance that comes from being on the front line of this work like you you guys are, is that my top takeaway is, is first as a leader at any level, as a leader, I've got to create psychological safety for my people, period. Not just because of COVID, period. I got to right, do that, right? right? And and why that's challenging is the nuance I'm hearing in there is that I'm burnt out too, right? Yeah. Because, you know, Joe or so-and-so or whoever, right. right? My organization has been dragging ass for quite a while anyway. And now this has pushed him over the top. So I really don't feel too bad for him because he's killing me, right? Like, in other words, really? sometimes the leader has to have that dialogue like oh, right you know right and and, Absolutely. And, yet, and yet at the same time um there's no there's no effects without cause and so maybe it's something that you know is is just irreparable and joe needs to move on from the organization maybe right. maybe that's needed right. for a while but before we get to that easy you know clean uh sometimes hard to do but uh you know easy answer like well let's just cut those people yeah. Right. We haven't fixed anything at the organizational level. We, we haven't become better or well, you know, our well-being hasn't improved at the organizational level because we're just going to find more Joes if that's the case. Right. 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 And so what we really should do is before we level set that is go, well, how do I prevent my own burnout? Um, 
and that might be your takeaway as, as we wind up the, the last, you know, 35, 40 second answer here. I'll give you a rapid fire one. What does a leader do to prevent their own burnout? But what I take away from this is to create psychological safety has to be there before any of this other happens. And then a path to that is to deploy empathy. And then a tactical way to do that is maybe this think, feel, say, do exercise, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. So that's kind of the net net of this. But what is something that a leader does to, to take away burnout as, as we wind up? And then we've got your website and stuff below, and I'm sure you'll have a lot of people yeah. follow up. I think one of the most powerful things that they can do is um, take off that badge of busy and not only lead from example and model that they need breaks, they need recovery, they need to stay, step away sometimes and recognize that in order to show up and perform at a really high level and be the leader that they need to be and sustain it and stay healthy and have some really good balance and work-life integration, they have to incorporate intentional recovery. And I'm not talking vacation, that's certainly included there, but sometimes I have to step away. Sometimes I'm not gonna step, check emails today because I'm gonna get to it tomorrow. Sometimes I'm gonna say, listen, I'm not available because I'm homeschooling my kid for an hour during this time. So not only incorporating those things into their own life, but talking about it, modeling it so that their team feels comfortable doing it for themselves. And ultimately what that creates now is sustained high performance for them and their team. That's awesome. Um, well, I can't thank you enough on behalf of everybody yeah. who's going to see this for, for, for spending some time with us. Uh, check her out on uh, LinkedIn and connect if you have any follow-ups or want to get in touch with Natalie. And then also Vital Solutions in the ticker there below. Um, another episode of Smarter B2B. Uh, thanks to Emerge. And Natalie, I can't thank you enough. It's great to reconnect. And I think. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Take thank care. You. All right. Be well, everybody.